the Hoffman Show. We're on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. It's overreaction Tuesday time. Linnell is with us. Uh, where can we catch you? We got overtime tonight? Overtime tonight. Overtime every day this week, I think, after today. So There you go. All right, so over on 106.7 The Fan. Uh, the program actually starts at six thirty, but I will give permission to our audience to start listening at seven <laughs> because uh, we wanna, we wanna, yeah, the first, the first thirty goes to seven. Uh, so that's how that goes. Uh, but we're always great to have Linnell with us on a Tuesday, and uh, we will get to kind of overreactions from the game or takes from the game. Judge whether they're overreactions, where we are in the season. But uh, let's let's dive into the trade today first. Montez Sweat to Chicago. You're going to get a high second round pick. Uh, likely, unless all of a sudden the Bears turn into something that they're not right now. I don't think Montez is going to be the difference maker. They're they're bringing him in to be a long term addition for them on the D line. Um, what do you think of it? I like it for Washington. You were probably going to lose him for nothing this off season. Um, I think he's been here uh, going five years now. Uh, has is yet to crack double digit sacks. I don't really look at Montez Sweat as a game changer. So. You know, anytime you get an opportunity to get a pick inside of the top 100, I think, you know, you have a chance to hit on a really good player. Chicago's not very good. They probably won't win a lot more games for the rest of the year. So there's potential that pick falls from anywhere between 33 and like probably 40 at the worst. Um, The one thing that I will give pause to is for whatever reason, Washington cannot hit on second round picks. No matter who is selecting them, you even go back to Sua Cravens. I know that name probably gives people some, uh, but. You know, I know because I was there. Yeah. So I, hopefully this new regime uh, is able to draft a lot better, but I'm happy for Montez. You know, hopefully he gets to, you know, get a change of scenery, maybe a little bit closer to home. I don't know how close proximity Chicago is to Atlanta. Defin- definitely not away. closer to home. He's going for plenty, pl- plenty of direct flights, but there's also plenty of direct flights to DC. 100%. And uh, hopefully he likes deep dish pizza. Yes. And cold, freezing terrible windy days um yeah i mean i think it's a it's a it's it's a must do for washington and if your only uh negative feedback on it is well they've been bad in the second round what do you what do you want them to do stop trying and hopefully like you said there it should probably be someone new making the picks hopefully they do better but this is a chance to get an impact level player that you control for four years at a very cheap rate where montez the other thing about montez too uh linnell is People don't realize how old he is. Like, not that he's like ancient. I mean, who 27? am I to tell him? He's 28. 28? Okay. So yeah, yeah, I think or I think he turns 28 like within the next like yeah, he turns 29 at some point during next season. Let me double check this uh real quick. Yeah, he's 27 now. Um, and he yeah, September Man, that's 4th. Dates. So that means he's probably only gonna get one big contract in his career. Yeah. So and that's the thing, is like, do you want to be the team that gives him that one and you know, with the edge rusher market where it is right now? You just can't afford to put that much money in. And oh. I, I hate it because I think he plays so well off of Deron Payne. Um, I would have, you know, as I've said during the show, like I probably would rather have uh, traded Chase Young uh, if I had my druthers about it. But Chase is young. Chase is a more impactful <laughs> pass rusher. Um, and I, I just, I think that they're hoping Chase rounds in a form. It's also the kind of thing where the market for Chase, I think is like, because Montez, we know exactly who he is as a player that's an easier trade to make and feel like you're getting good value versus young where it's like, I don't know, is he good? Is he bad? He's still so young. He's still inexperienced. He's coming off the knee injury. Um, he's still learning how to play at this level. Like there's a lot of stuff and he's already almost as productive, if not more productive uh, in a lot of statistical categories than Montez. Yeah. And I think just looking at the production of both of them, I, I wouldn't have been upset if they both got dealt. I mean, I just, you haven't really seen game changing play from either of them. And when you've won as few games as Washington has over the past four seasons, I think, and I'm not trying to speak in hyperbole, anybody should be available if the price is right. That means 17 on offense. That, and I know cap hits and dead money and all that affects deals. But, like, the point is, I think they need to tear this thing down to the studs. It's a group that likes each other, but maybe they like each other too much, Craig, because I've never seen a team that likes each other so much, but then doesn't play hard all the time. So it's it's very interesting. All right, let's get to the takes from the game uh, slash the takes from where we are in the season. Hit me hit me with a take. Overreaction barometer is tuned up and ready to go. My first take from Sunday is that I think the offense performed much better, not because of the changes on the offensive line, but the changes from Eric Bieniemy as a play caller. I thought 
the game plan we saw Sunday should be the game plan we see for the rest of the season. Open up with a quick passing game. Get Sam Howell in rhythm early. Try to run the football. We saw a couple of draws throughout the game as well. I, I love the game plan. And then you saw them counter off of the game plan as the game moves on. Teams start biting and squatting on your quick passing game. So you take them up top uh, with Sam Howell. He makes a beautiful throw to Terry McCorn in the red zone. So I thought offensively they were really good. But I don't know how much it has to do with the offensive line. I just think Eric Bietemi was much sharper and tell me if I'm overreacting. I think he called his best game as an offensive coordinator. I agree. Um, I don't think that's an overreaction. I think that is good analysis, my friend. Um, I my, It's almost frustrating. Um, I've said this a couple times now, but like, where has this been? Like, what, what took so long know. to get this deep into the screen game, to get much more three-step drop instead of all this five-step drop? Like, the pocket move. There, there's all kinds of stuff that is just so good. And, and I think the reason it's frustrating, the reason I feel comfortable being that critical with it is because we saw all this stuff in camp. Yeah. Like this is, that is what we thought the offense would be coming out of camp. And then all of a sudden it's all this five-step drop nonsense and Sam's getting murdered. Um, and you're like, what happened to the, the stuff that we, that was, Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Um, and so it had it had those Scott Turner vibes of just like the answers are right here. Why don't why don't you use them? I think the other thing too is I think Sam moved in the pocket like different quarterback level better than he 100%. had the previous whatever number of games that have been seven games. He really like slid around and like there's a couple of pressures where he just gets out of the way and you're like, that's great. That's what you're supposed to do. And so I think part of that is the comfortability where he's like feeling the game better due to the play calling. Um, I do think that like Larson probably also got some of the assignment stuff better. Yeah. Um, there, there's probably an uptick there. That's probably the biggest change, but like not like Chris Paul was awesome. Um, he, yeah. he definitely missed some stunts like, and stuff that you'd expect from a guy who's in his right. second career start. Um, so there, there's Give him definitely credit, though, that, uh, yeah. that B Rob run that pops for 29. I mean, he just, Oh yeah. He's stonewall. I don't know who it was, but there was yeah, a definitely, big man movement. Definite impact. Yeah. yeah. So like Chris Paul was kind of what you'd expect, which is a little bit worse probably than Sadiq had been playing down for down. Um, but some of the bigger mistakes don't happen and the game plans better. And I, I think you're dead on there. The one thing I was also going to say, kind of making a funny, maybe Eric Bianami thought he was going to get traded by the trade deadline. So he thought, let me call my best game. But we know it's not possible to trade offensive coordinator. No, that is that is true. That is like a very no. Rivera thing that has happened throughout Ron's entire careers. Right when the the heat, like there's the old like boiling frog thing where it's like, you know, if you drop, if you drop a frog in boiling water, they jump right back out because they're like, oh, damn, that's hot. But yeah. if you drop them in water and then like the heat turns up, they, that's how you boil a frog. I guess that's a thing people do we go. Uh, because they don't realize that the gradual change Rivera is like, this is getting very hot. And then he, he does something differently or, you know, they play a better game and that's just been him. Ron Rivera, not a, not a frog. That's, that's the analogy there. And it seemed like he'd be had a little bit of that on Sunday. Yeah. I was honestly surprised. Like when you think about it, they kind of tricked us. Um, I was talking to someone over the weekend and they were like, man, I think it's funny how on Friday's practice they showed, or I think it was Wednesday's practice, they show Tyler Larson snapping to Sam Howell and then Nick Gates was snapping to Jacoby. I thought Nick Gates was going to end up getting the start at guard. Uh, he is now on the bench. When you look big picture, I don't love that uh, because oh, of the I fact that he was one of your free agent signings and you whiffed on another one and when you look at the track record of them in free agency it sucked outside of jd mckissick yeah no it's been really bad but linnell i'm gonna teach you a life lesson here my friend mm -hmm. you heard of the phrase sunk cost sunk cost no okay so sunk cost is an economic concept that is basically says like if you've spent the money already and it's not working it's just it's a sunk cost doesn't mean you need to keep investing in it just take the loss and keep moving on. And to me, that's where you're at with Nick Gates. You have two young players in Sadiq and Chris Paul that you hope can be a part of your offensive line in the future. I would much rather just get them go, hey, Nick, keep your uh, great attitude around the building. We love your toughness. Uh, you're, you seem to be a delightful human. Keep being a good dude. You're going to get your checks because that's how professional football works. But uh, you're a backup center now. Wish you would have had some sunk costs last year at quarterback. Holy cow. That's probably a term I used at some point last year. Let's just let's just say let's that. Just say that. Uh, all right, uh, Linnell's with us. It's Overreaction Tuesday here on the Hoffman Show. All right, what is your next take slash overreaction? 
I was very critical of the defense on Sunday, and I've been critical of them all year, but Sunday kind of was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me. This is the most underachieving unit in all of the National Football League in terms of sides of the football, like off Miami's offense, they're overachieving probably or, or doing exactly what people thought. Chicago's offense maybe is underachieving because Justin Fields hadn't taken the leap we all expected. But the reason you talked positive, positively about this Washington football team coming into the season was because of their defense. And the reason we were comfortable and confident with rolling with a fifth round pick at quarterback was because of the defense. They have completely underachieved this year. I'm honestly baffled at the lack of production that they've gotten. Sunday was no different. They've allowed a hundred yard receiver in every week outside of week one. And yes, I know Darren Waller had 98 yards last week. That's a hundred in my book. It's not very good. <laughs> not very good. Um, the only other, I just did a quick like standings glance to be like, mm, worst bet, like biggest underachievers in the league. The other one that would come to mind as a contender to me is the Giants offense. Yeah. The Giants last year offensively, like kind of came up with a formula. Dable and, and Kafka and everybody did a good job. Daniel Jones looked like a completely different player. Uh, Saquon looked like they, they look like they've found something and they have been awful. Obviously, Jones hasn't been playing, but like they were not good when he was in. Uh, I mean, this weekend was an adventure and all adventures with Tommy DeVito coming in at quarterback where they ran the ball 36 times. DeVito, by the way, do you see his final stats? I believe it was, was it negative one yards? Yes, yeah, two of seven, negative one yards. Oh, yeah. New York Giants football, baby. Um, and they lost to them the week before. Anyway, the point is, yeah, no, the commanders are supposed to be a top five unit. And, you know, I had a YouTube comment uh, on one of the videos being like, you know, Never we need to start comments. talking about them. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow at this time. Not, not today. Um, but it was like, we need to start talking about them like what they are, a bottom five unit. And I was like, that seems harsh. Let me go look. Oh, my God. They're second worst in the league in yards and and points. Like, they're a bottom five defense. They're a bottom three defense. I think they're 28th in uh, defensive DVOA. So, they're terrible. They're horrible. And, and there's and no the, like. The thing is, um, and this is where it's so hard, and like where Logan and I got into it a little bit on Take Command recording today, is like from a process standpoint, it's actually not terrible. The problem is they have all the like they have these DBs that are in position all the time to make plays and never make a play. Don't. And so, like the touchdown to AJ Brown, Forbes is in position, Quan's late and a bad angle. Really, Quan should get there. So maybe that that's. That's like a half good example, but like Forbes is rolling that. Forbes just needs to make a freaking play. Um, you know, the BSJ one, the one-handed catch, like, congratulations, AJ Brown. You're a monster. Um, I mean, he can't be in better position. The only way AJ Brown makes that catch is if it's outside with one hand and he does. And you're like, well, shoot, if he's gonna do that, like what the hell do you want me to do? But like the Danny Johnson uh, Julio Jones play is like a perfect example. Danny plays that technically perfect hand yeah. through Julio's hands rips at the ball Julio's too strong he's too big he, he keeps the ball cams a, a second late to hit to the hit um but makes like a, a hit that definitely separates a lot of dudes from the ball and Julio Jones hangs on Eagles made plays commanders didn't and so from like a process standpoint the process on a lot of this stuff coverage bust aside is pretty good but they've had a couple of those busts and I think the big one goes back to the D line where if you want to help out your DBs Let's make it so the quarterback is feeling pressure. And the, to the lack of pressure this year, especially in big spots, I think is like that's where this defense has completely fallen apart. And that's really where my my comment stems from about them underachieving. Is It's in particular the defensive line specifically, like four first-round picks along that front. We all know the same song and dance. You mentioned them not getting pressure in the biggest spots. It just felt like watching the game that Jalen Hurts was never hurried and he was pretty banged up. Like you saw a couple of plays like where he's like limping off the field. Like he was not right. And they still weren't able to get to him. So the only thing I would say from like a coaching standpoint that I was kind of frustrated with, heat him up, right? Like you see that he's limping. You see that you're getting no pressure. Like why not blitz? So here's the thing. They blitzed way more than you think. Really? Like looking back at it, I was like, oh, especially early. And they got burned in some of the man-to-man -man situations. And Jack definitely backed off a little bit as the game went. But like, Part of that, like part of it is, hey, if you want to be who you 
claim you want to be. You need to figure it out how to get that pressure. You need to win the one on ones. You need to, yeah. you know, schematically be a little bit more creative and and get the slides and whatever. Part of it is this Eagles de- or offensive line is so freaking good. Like yeah. the way, not just like they will win their blocks, but they communicate and pass things off. And like Kelsey is so good at identifying the proper people that they're bringing five, six man pressures and the Eagles have the numbers and they just win. Like they're in the right place, they're prepared and then they win their blocks. And so there there was actually way more pressure in terms of blitz calls in this game than anybody would imagine, which is not necessarily a good thing. It just kind of shifts the blame from the coaches to the players of like, well, if that's the case, eventually someone's got to win on one-on-one. And like John won a couple, Duran won a couple, but it gets back to the lack of finishing. We're like, enough, can you... Though. Can you bring, I mean, PFF had John with six pressures in the game. Allen had a good one, but he doesn't have a sack. Like, how do you, how do you, and and like, how do you make it so that Hurts has poor throws because of that pressure? And it just didn't feel like they affected. Like, I, I'm with you, man. Like, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. But then you go back and you watch it and you're like, well, damn, they tried. They just gotta, they gotta be better. It's not necessarily trying harder. It's, it's doing better. I think also, and I know we use this word a lot to describe like Jack's defense. They're so vanilla with what they do up front. They never overload the side. They never, they never do anything fancy. It feels like right. It's always this. It's either their five man cinco front or they're lined up man on. We call it five zero. You just run and, and win your individual matchup. Like guys haven't been winning their individual matchups really all year on a consistent basis. So at some point, I feel like you have to make a change in that area. Something else that I was frustrated with, I just don't, the lack of hustle from guys along the defensive front bothers me, especially when you're in a high stakes situation, you're in an NFC's football game at home. So what if your initial power move doesn't work? That doesn't mean you just stand there and mirror the damn tackle. I was so frustrated with watching that on Sunday. And I know fans on Twitter are, like, clipping off stuff. That's all fine and dandy. I normally, like, get annoyed at that type of stuff. But the players need to hear it. Have some damn pride about your craft, man. What if we came on the radio and talked like this the entire time to try to get your attention? It just, when when they when they don't play hard and you don't see guys chasing the football, it, it lets me know that may, maybe there's, like, friction going on within the group. Because you can't tell me you're watching film. And Jeff Scanina isn't chewing people's ass out. The Some of the stuff they're putting on tape is embarrassing, Craig. And I'm not trying to speak in hyperbole. Don't do your pros, man. Your pros. Some of y'all don't have contracts and you want to earn contracts. Well, earn it. It's frustrating, man. Yeah. So this is normally the point where I think everyone would expect me to shout you down and tell you to stop overreacting. And I'm not going to because you're right. Yeah. Like this. And I... I typically hate this kind of stuff because I have so much respect for how hard the job is. But the first thing you said in there is like, to me, the most important one, which is if your initial move doesn't work, that you can't give up on the play. And 99 was easily the worst offender on this, where if his initial move didn't work, he played patty cake with Jordan Mailata. And look, as I said on Take Command, Sometimes it might look like you're paying, playing pat a cake with Jordan Mailata and you're not. But it's just that Jordan Mailata is 6'8 and 400 pounds and you're like, and moves like a, a, a nimble, nimble polar bear. And you're just like, oh, he's trying really hard. Mailata just eh, eh, pushes just him away. It's a long day at the office. Yeah, it's, it's hard. But like you see when James and Casey are in there and like Casey sack, like there's a pursuit level there exactly. that you're not getting when Chase is on the field. And Even so, in the run game, though, Craig, I watched. Oh, Max the run Crosby game's bad, game. man. Like a bat out of hell coming off the edge, man. I never right. see that from our guys. Ever. No, and and that's the thing. It's like there is. This is why I think the trade for Montez is like ultimately a good thing. Yeah, and why you know if it's flipped and Chase is gone and Montez is still here, like I think Montez would have to pick it up some. And I don't know that Chase is going to, if I'm being totally honest. But like. There is something to having a mix of playmakers and kind of do your job hustle guys on a D line. And they had too many playmakers and not enough do your job hustle guys. And you'd see it when those do your job hustle guys come in either one at a time, or even sometimes like the line play in a, as a whole was just as solid or better yep. when it's the twos. And why is that? Because guys are just all out going to where they're supposed to be. And, and I think there's also Logan, Logan mentioned this. And I think it's a really great point. Like 
make Lane Johnson work. Make my lot of work, That's right? True. If that initial move doesn't work and they're really smart, it's not going to work. They're not going to let you beat them with a the thing that you want to do. Right. So even if you don't have like a great counter in your repertoire or they're good enough to counter it, make them do it. Make them do that work. Try that for a couple snaps. Go to the sideline. Let your sub come in. Keep doing that. And they're not subbing out. Like wear them down over the course of a game so that in a big spot late in a game, you're going against a tired tackle. And that didn't happen on Sunday. And thus the Eagles, fresh, it, you know, great team comes down, closes the game out. Commanders don't have it at the end. And that's how Philly winds up on top. Yeah, I, this is my, my last piece on it. I, I hope I hope I don't see that moving forward much longer. Because now that I feel like it's been called out on Twitter, we know the people in Ashburn pay attention to Twitter. It's it, so sad that pride. you're right on that. It's, it's going to so be a sad. pride thing at some point because – that that is not a good look, especially when you got teams trying to trade for you. Like that's that ain't a good look. But I, I will say this about Casey in particular: he's got to get more snaps. I mean, his closing speed, and I'm not trying to guess. It looks like it's amongst. He looks like one of the aliens when he closes, like your TJ and your Micah and your. And I'm not saying he has that type of ability, but man, you see flashes of it. If everyone on the defense played as hard as Casey Tuhill played, they wouldn't be bottom four in DVOA. Point blank. I think that's well said. All right, that's Linnell Willingham. You want more of him? 6.30 technically is on, but we'll let you change the state. We lock your your dial in place because people still have radio dials, Linnell. Yeah. Do you even know what a radio dial is? Have you ever had an analog radio? Isn't that the twisty thing in the car where you turn the knob? Yeah, have you ever had to do that, whether it's on a car radio or your, your home radio, where you had to like truly tune your radio? Craig, I'm a radio historian. That's how I started listening to sports okay. on the radio I swear I was just trying to figure out like our cuz I I also did and we're we're 7 8 years apart in age and like it's one of those things where like you're we're not like we're the same mostly generation but like you probably don't remember printing off map quest directions Oh, never. I would like you've sorry. always kind of had GPS turn yeah. by turn on the phone. Tom, Tom, there, you have the little Tom, there, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. So that's like where your GPS journey begins. For me, it was like you had to go on mapquest.com, type in your route, and then print off the directions. That oh. was, that was like the previous thing. And then like my grandfather somehow drove with a map in front of his face and and you'd be like, how can you see the road? You have a giant map of Long Island in front of your face. How do you know where face. the exits are? I think it's the craziest thing that people are using maps. Like that's honestly ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, but then you have people driving around right now listening to us be like, these young kids, we drop them, like they, they're just idiots. They, they're they yeah. lost without right, their phones. Like, it's like, yes, right just- this, is, this is how we grew up as yeah. people who needed phones for everything. All right, anyway, the point is, Linnell's on overtime tonight. Uh, it starts at 6.30. He's there the entire week over on 106.7 The Fan, uh, and he's with us every Tuesday for Overreaction Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir, my man. What's up, kiddos? It's your boy, Clinton Yates from ESPN. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. Tell your mama I said what's up.